Amen. Okay. We're going to have a very special moment. Of let, how, what do you think, Josh and Amy, if we put, make a little living room up here on the stage? you think that'd be the better? You want to help me grab a chair? Come on up. So uh, we have been uh, trying to devote a focus for some time on um, encountering Jesus, loving Jesus, and uh, Josh last Sunday talked about cultivating the fire of the Holy Spirit, and in the book of Revelation, let's see, how about I, I kind of living room it, and we, let's see, one more, per, here, I got it, I got it, Amy, here you go, so, so, uh, Josh delivered a very powerful, I would call it a prophetic exhortation to our family to rekindle a fire for Jesus. And, um, you know, in some cases, as you've heard and experienced in your life, sometimes um, it almost feels like you have to start a fire as, with soaked logs in a puddle. You know, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're so depleted by life, so hurt by life, overwhelmed by life, and you just feel like everything is just non-burnable. But we have a precedence of when Elijah comes and, and basically soaks down the fire and says, come Holy Spirit. So what we're asking for is a supernatural igniting of a love fire in our hearts, in our family, as we round into 2000, uh, 2023. So I felt like it would be really good to uh, just have a conversation with Amy and Josh as to some of the practical ways they've been cultivating a fire for Jesus in their life over the last season that they've been in. And um, first of all, I want to honor you too. Like you are an amazing gift to this family. And I just want all of us to just affirm that. Like, like, like it was love at first sight with Josh first before Amy, because Amy was out in the nations. And um, we have walked together, and I just so appreciate who they are in the Lord and who we get to be together. And so I'm going to ask the Lord to do something wonderful, and that is do a transaction or an impartation today. Not just information, but impartation. And we're going for revelation more than content because revelation hits us at a deeper level. It sure, it sure has good content. It's always got truth, but it opens up something in a, in a way that we're never the same again. We see life totally different. And so what we're going after in our conversation is I'm asking the Lord for the ground they've taken in the spirit over the last, you know, 16, 18, 20 months, that the, the things they have absorbed, the DNA that's in you guys, will just go whoosh and just just impregnate all of us in our hearts. I know maybe that's a weird word, but you to get the seeds, the seeds of the word land in our hearts and cause fruitfulness to come forth. So I'm going to pray for this moment right now, and then I've got questions. I'm going to just let them free flow. And it's going to be a fun, like, uh, family conversation around how to cultivate the fire of God. So, Lord, we ache. We ache. Like we're hungry. Like we were meant to live at a level of presence and life that is profound. And we don't want to live beneath what you purchased on the cross. So we're asking today to ignite a fire even if our logs are soaked. And we, we need a supernatural outpouring of grace in this 
weird world we're living in. So today, cause something powerful to take place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Okay, beloved, wonderful ones. Um, I don't know which one of you feels comfortable going first, but we're going to try to dial down into some of the practicals of how you've cultivated this fire, Josh. And so you guys can decide who goes first. And so Josh, practicals. And so he's going to story and share and try to co-regulate, try to connect with this person, this beautiful man and woman, and let what's, what's going on in them come into you. Okay, so Josh, paint on our hearts. <laughs> All right. Well, first, I want to say um, uh, it's really awesome, actually, to be here with everybody this morning. Like, we wake up excited to gather with this family and worship the Lord. Like, we're we're excited. We don't care. Like, well, we we do care, but like, we 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 love worshiping with the family. Like, it's just it's so powerful. And, and it's just such an awesome thing. So it's so wonderful just being here with everybody. And I think um, Tim's question, you know, burning for Jesus. Like, how do you burn for Jesus? And for us, as we've talked about it in our individual lives, in our marriage, there's one keystone verse that we, it comes back to, and it's actually Proverbs 4.23. And it says this, Above all else, guard your heart, for it flows the wellspring of life. Out of your heart flows the wellspring of life. So the first thing he writes is above all else. So now this is the Proverbs. Like these are words of wisdom. Solomon is writing to his son and daughters. He's writing to his children. He's saying, listen, above all things, there's one thing I'm going to ask you to do, and that's guard your heart, because out of your heart will flow well, wellsprings of life. Well, a lot of people think guarding your heart is, man, you got to guard your heart from negativity. Well, that is true. You need to guard your heart from negativity. You need to guard your heart from bitterness. You need to guard your heart from unforgiveness. You need to guard your heart from sin. Like, all these things are, are true. But I think, really, when it comes to guarding your heart, for me, and I know for Amy, when we look at what it means to guard our heart, it actually guarding our passion for Jesus is the above all else. Because when you walk passionate for Jesus, all those other things grow strangely dim. And so, guard your heart means guarding your passion for Jesus, guarding your affections for Jesus, guarding your obedience for Jesus, guarding your yes for Jesus. It's, it's, this, it's this place of, I, when I guard my heart, I, I guard my burn for Jesus. And out of that flows the wellspring of life. Well, who's the wellspring of life? Jesus himself, he's the, really is this place, like that is something that we do um, protect on a daily and weekly basis. And so one, one of the ways uh, we do that is, is we have this umbrella um, statement we share with one another. It's like, man, what's stirring your affections for Jesus? Really, that, that question, what's stirring your affections for Jesus? What's making you passionate after him right now? And, and, and whatever is stirring your affections for Jesus, you feed it. Um, so here's a couple of examples. So like, the word of God is a big deal to us. Um, we spend a lot of time in the word. And, and so for me personally, I, I spend a lot of time in uh, the word as just the, the Bible versus like a phone. Does that make sense? I think there actually is a difference in interacting with the word of God. So I make an effort to spend time in the word and I read until he speaks. And then I stop. So I don't keep reading. I actually stop because I'm not reading to read. I'm reading to connect with a person. And so, so I stop and then I, I actually circle key words that I feel like the Lord is speaking. And then I just start a dialogue. It's a conversation. And I just say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? I know you're showing me things in this. And, and it, what happens is that scripture actually comes out and just just jumps on you it literally it jumps in you so one example of this is um uh uh gosh about eight years ago the lord gave me a prayer to pray over my daughters 
And I was in the scripture, and it was Luke chapter 1. I was just fascinated with Luke chapter 1. I knew there was an encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 1 for me. And um, there's this particular verse. It's about John the Baptist, but the verse says this. The child grew in his love for God and became powerful in the Holy Spirit. And when I read that, it was like Jesus was speaking to me, and I knew that was a crafted prayer to be praying over my daughter. So... Over the course of years, we put them to bed, and then many times before we go to bed, I go in the room, and, and this, is, this is very private here, so don't tell the girls I do this, because most of the time they don't. But I go in, and I lay my hands on them, and I just say, you'll burn for Jesus, and you'll be powerful in the Holy Spirit. And, and like, it's, it's interesting, because over the course of time, we're seeing their hearts now begin to burn, and I really believe that started eight years ago, with that encounter with him in the scripture. I mean, we just, Adeline, like, that was just, for me, that was just really neat that she had the courage to share that um, to Danny, what was on her heart, you know? And, but it's because she's hearing his voice and she's burning. So that's one way in, in the scriptures. And the other way is, um, you know, life is busy, right? So it's hard to open up the word of God sometimes for everybody. So I actually use a, an app called the Abide app. The Dwell app, I got it wrong, sorry. The Dwell app. Um, I have a few apps on my phone, but the dwell app is the one I use a lot and it's really neat because you can listen to the word of God. You can pick the voice, you can pick the translation and you can put music behind it and it just makes the word come alive auditory, auditorily. And so, um, my days usually start pretty early. So I wake up between 4:30 and 4:45. I go to CrossFit, try to, um, just because that physical exercise is really important for me. Um, and then I have a window between 6 and 7 uh, every day where I try to make um, the girls lunches and snacks and um, have, like, uh, Amy's coffee or a tea ready when, when she's going in the morning. I just feel like that's a way I can serve my family. I can model my burning for Jesus. Like, I'm a servant leader. And so and I want to take the weight off of them and Amy just, just to serve. And so, But what I do is I put that app in and I just listen to the Word of God while I'm doing that. So it's really neat because it's, it, I, it's in my earbuds and it's really neat because I can really hear his word while doing things and being on the fly and serving the family. And so, because sometimes sitting down and reading isn't practical. It's like there's stuff I need to do that we got to get done to start the day. And this is a way that actually helps me get in the word more. So those are two ways um, to get in the word. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Keep, keep um, going. Well, hold okay, on. This is what I'm hoping that an impartation just happened for a kind of another awakening of how just how important living with the script, living with Jesus in the scripture is. I got the dwell app and uh, it is incredible, but I also do the same thing in the word. So I just want to come in as Josh, I'm thinking, could you just take and just bust a prayer, release a prayer because there is a lot of warfare over the word, our relationship with the word. And hell does not want us cracking our Bibles and reading. I mean, I'm serious. And so I'm going to ask that we break that spirit of distraction and interruption and go for our impartation to this, where a new love affair happens with Jesus through the word. Did you just pray for that, John? Yeah, Lord, I pray for all of us that we could take a new... We'd have a new relationship with the scriptures, and that's, I'm here to meet Jesus. I'm not here just to read. I'm here to meet Jesus in the word. And I pray, God, that every single person would find and feel your presence in the scriptures, and that there'd be a, a new awakening of love for your word and interacting with you in your word in Jesus' name. I think another thing in that, this is what's cool, is... Um, with that word is uh, uh, about six days of the week, we actually sit down with our kids and we read through the Action Bible. And so our kids have actually been through the Bible probably three, four times now. And, um, and, and it's actually really neat. This is a really re cool resource because it's got pictures. But what's kind of mind-blowing, I find myself doing it more for me than them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> to learn the stories and interact with the Lord. Um, and so, but that's another piece with the word. 
I think um, I'm, I was glad that Josh brought that up too, because that's something that we um, just as a family have felt like the Lord gave us an invitation that um, we're to model it. So our kids oftentimes will wake up in the morning and they'll walk in and find you know, me reading my Bible and they'll, or they'll walk out to the living room and find Josh reading his Bible. And I remember growing up as a child and waking up and finding my mom in the living room with her cup of tea by the fire, reading her Bible. And it sounds like a simple thing, but it's a modeling and so much is caught more than it's taught. And so, um, just that little, um, and they know dad and mom, the, we, the first thing we do in the morning, that that's our, that's our time with Jesus is to seek his face. And I, and they even notice a difference in my countenance when I didn't take the time to be with Jesus. It's like, oh, wow, mom, did you have your time with Jesus this morning? <laughs> like, want to get back in there, mom? You know, <laughs> and it's, it's true that because it's, it's that place of just presencing with him and out of him flows life and out of him flows peace and out of him flows the ability to love well. I cannot love well apart from Jesus and him filling me fresh every day. But the other thing is that we just felt like um, during the COVID season, the Lord just put this strong impression on our hearts that we're to, to place a stake in the ground with our children. And we had already been doing the Bible, but we felt like we needed to get them up earlier in the morning. Not really early. We don't get them up like the Grusendorf girls or anything. But <laughs> We get them up a little earlier in the morning and we sit down as a family and maybe Josh is getting the breakfast ready and I sit down on the couch with them and we pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to give us hearts that are fertile soil that would plant seeds in our heart as we read his word so it doesn't just become like root you know, routine. And then we read through the stories together and oftentimes they'll be like, Mom, do we have to stop? Can we keep going? And they're hungry. They're passionate about Jesus and, and the word. They love, they love encountering him. And then we stop and we pray. We ask, um, okay, what are some praise, what are some prayer re requests that we have for the day? And I'll have Adeline pray for Annika and I'll have Annika pray for Adeline's teacher. And Elise is usually not as much in the mix, but she, you know, she, she can hang. She's just sometimes, she can hang. She's just sometimes not as helpful in, in the whole um, pray for one another realm, but um, <laughs> she's like hitting someone or something, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, the seeds are going in, you know what I mean? But, and, and then we'll, and then we'll rehearse testimonies of prayers that we'll rehearse testimonies from the prayers that we've had the days before. It was like, Hey, how did that test go for you that you felt anxious about Adeline? And she's like, Oh, you know, I got an A and then we stop and we thank Jesus. And we rehearsed like somebody had a relational difficulty and the Lord made a way where there was no way. And we had prayed for two weeks and there was a breakthrough and we just stop and rehearse that testimony. So it's just, it's just taking time with our kids to build that personal relationship and personal history with Jesus. And it's only, I mean, we don't spend more than 13 minutes a morning with our kids, but, and then in the evening we do the same thing before bed, but it just is, it has created like sort of the stake in the ground, like that word is getting inside their hearts and it's planting seeds that will grow fruit and, and bear fruit as they grow. So good. Amy, that, this, this is so profound. I, I hope young families, old families are picking up just creating that culture. Would you pray over very overwhelmed, busy people that we can literally integrate Jesus and the word into our family life. I thought that was incredible what you just shared. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, Lord, we do. I just right now want to just release the grace, the creativity, the anointing for, for mothers and fathers, for aunts and uncles, for friends and grandparents, Lord, to just be able to step into that place of stewarding the children in their lives as their first disciples, their first fruits of discipleship, Lord, and that they, they would just have, that you would put in their spirits creative ways, plant seeds of creativity for how to just cultivate a fire and a passion for you, Jesus, an ability to interact with your word and to know your voice and to be led by your spirit. And I just release great grace, great favor, and the anointing of your spirit to do it over this family in Jesus' name. I'm going to add one more thing. Lord, give practical help. First of all, dissolve any shame or guilt, you know, because, hey, we start where we start. 
And sometimes we just need to start. So, Lord, give us wisdom and grace to know a step we could take today or tomorrow toward and into this direction. Okay, Lord, I ask, speak one step toward and into what Amy and Josh are describing as a family rhythm in Jesus' name. Beautiful. Okay. How are we doing? Everybody okay? You liking this? All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, by the way, I never heard any of this as a young couple I, and with our babies. I wished I would have heard this when I had, when we had our children. This was never talked to us, to us about. We tried uh, quiet times and devotionals and it was a little rough, but we, we finally had to break and do different things. But this is profound stuff. And so I want to thank you guys for pay, being pioneers and paving a way for new families to walk into this rhythm. I think of really big things happening right now. Yeah, and I think I think um, a part of this is, you know, um, pretty much any any human being can latch onto this. Um, and we, we've been we learned this in our sabbatical, and we're still trying to practice this today as the pressures of life um, creep in. I mean, it, life is full of pressure. Um, everybody feels it like there's enough problems, um, to keep you up all night each and every day. I mean, I get why Jesus says, it's just worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Cause today has enough worries in itself. Like, um, but here, here's what I was going to say. One thing we like to say now is present people are presence people. So present people are presence people. So what I'm saying there is going back to Proverbs chapter 4, guard your heart above all else. You know, there's all these things distracting you, distracting you, distracting you, pulling on your affections, pulling on your thinking, pulling on your, um, your ability to, you know, spend time with your wife or your kids, okay? And those things actually keep you from being present. Does that make sense? Like, how many can relate to what I'm saying? Like, I'm here, but I'm not here right? So we all can relate to that. But when you guard your affections for Jesus, you actually are living out of your true self. So then the relationships that are are around you and that matter most, they get the present person, the person of who you are in Christ. And out of that, the presence of God is in exchange between one another. So, so with our kids and, you know, with uh, our marriage and all that, we really try to protect that passion for Jesus so we can be present with one another. I, am I making sense? Like, I know this stuff, might be, this stuff's like deep stuff. This is stuff we're trying to really cultivate and work on. So I, another thing that has helped us in being present and um, guarding our hearts is this, this is actually the discipline of prayer and and communion so amy and i actually we will pray together anywhere between three and ten times a day like we pray in the morning with our kids we pray with one another when we've got to start stuff then we pray before bed like we just have a rhythm of prayer but also there's a lot of times in the day like she'll call me or i'll call her and be like hey can we pray together we pray in the middle of the night a lot um we pray in the middle of the night more than I would like, but we do often, <laughs> and it's not his fault. <laughs> oh, well, I think what will happen is that I'll, I'll, I'll wake up, and there'll be something weighing on my heart and weighing on my mind, and, and I've lost that peace. And there's lots of things I do to return to peace in Jesus, return to joy. Um, but, I'll, I mean, I'll, I will lay there oftentimes and just, you know, turn my affections towards Jesus. There's an app on the Dwell app called... Um, a peaceful night and it has all these verses about trust in Jesus um, and just putting our, our, our hope and our turning our gaze towards him. And I'll sometimes put my earbuds and listen to that because I try not to bother him. But also he has given me permission that we can agree in prayer and we will sometimes, I mean, intercede as much as three hours in the night and tell, and then there's a breakthrough and a peace. And then it's like, okay, we'll let that go. So. Okay. Hold on. We got to pray and release that one. (laughs) Like that? Let me expand on that. Yeah, because expand on it, and then we're going to pray I, and release that you know, grace into the house. I think I think one of the roles of a husband is to um, 
be a safe place for his wife. And so that means like, listen, I know I have a lot to do. Now, granted, everybody needs to sleep. But if there's something burdening, burdening her, I'm not there to fix it. I can't. But I can be there to be with her and make sure she's not alone in it. Because the answer isn't me. The answer is Jesus. And so many times it'll be like, okay, let me hold you. Let's listen to the word. Um, let, I'll agree with you. Let's pray. And, and um, I see these things as an opportunity to build the most important thing, and that's our marriage. You know, that's our connection. That's our, um, our journey together. And so, um, and uh, so, again, present people are presence people. Like, you can be present in the moment, and God just shows up. So, so yeah, so let's pray that. You don't intercede for three hours in the night. That's not the point. <laughs> hey, Josh, just before you pray, this presence thing, presence and presencing, uh, tease that out just a tad more because, you know, for me personally, you know, I've got, I'm spinning plates and Janet has expressed real hurt when I'm distracted and it doesn't feel like I'm connected to her because I'm problem solving at the table and she'll actually stop me and say, I don't, you're here, but you're not here. You're not here. You, I don't feel you've connected to me. You're connecting with me and, um, and I don't feel as important to you as whatever that problem is. And it really hurts her heart. And so I've actually told her, please, if you sense that I've wandered, correct me. Speak to that, Josh, because, you know, I don't know, maybe if you've never had that problem, but. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm still in the middle of this, like learning this discipline. Um, well, I, I think there's, there's a couple things. Again, it goes back to Proverbs 4.23, guarding your heart, for out of it flows the wellspring of life. It, it, you know, I'm guarding my passion for Jesus. And when I become more consumed with the worries that I'm facing, the problems that I'm facing, rather than burning for him, something's off. Because faith doesn't come through uh, seeing, it comes through hearing. So it's really cool. The Bible speaks of the heart as an organ yep. that can open or close, like that quick, like your pupil, boom, boom. And it can connect or disconnect, it can get hard or soft. So basically you're saying be self-aware is my heart open right now and connected? Mm -hmm. Whatever language you want to use, I mean, there's other, you know, the relational switch or your, but the fact is the heart is fluid. And at a, in, in an instant, I can get hurt or distracted and close my heart or distract my heart. So right now we're talking about really being self-aware, right? Correct. Of connecting our heart with Jesus and the people we're in front of because that seems to open up the unseen realm. Correct. Yeah, and that's why I say faith comes through hearing, not seeing, because I'm seeing all these problems around me, but I'm not hearing him in the moment. Okay. Does that make sense? I'm not current. I'm not with current with Jesus. I lost my burn. I lost, so it's like, so then my connection. So then I pause. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm hungry for you. Okay. You got this. Now I can be present with my family. I can be, I can... I can be present with my kids. Like, um, you know, uh, it's just so amazing. We've all been in that position when a child comes out, like, especially little kids, like, Daddy, will you come play with me? It's like, oh, I'm too busy. It's like, hold on, hold on. Am I too busy? Jesus. Yes. You know, you get what I'm saying there? So that, yeah, so it's, it's this ability to be present and taking my eyes off the things around me and just keeping them on. Oh, yes, Lord, I love you. And I love them. Lord, I just thank you that the cross gives us a whole new realm to live by. And that the, the, that the, I just want to declare um, your word that um, Paul wrote in Colossians right now, that he has revealed to the Gentiles the glorious mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I pray, Father, for that awareness, that self-awareness 
So much so that it's, it's now this place like, wow, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I can be at peace. I, can, I don't have to um, fight all my battles. You've got them, Jesus. You're good at your job. And that my job is to protect my life union with you. And out of that flows the, the, the issues of life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been fed. We got more. So, Amy, I'm going to turn to you. If you, if, as you think about this, this cultivating fire and love affair, what has been really helpful for you in your life to bring you to that place of love affair with Jesus, white hot love? a really profound question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that um, that's an evolving question, of course, as we go through seasons and times. And I think that um, I'm actually just coming out of a season um, that was a really precious protected season with Jesus. And um, he invited me into that season because I was one of the five virgins who didn't have a reservoir of oil. I had, my lamp was burning out and I didn't have reserve. And Jesus came to me and said, Amy, you're, um, I was living a life of perpetual sacrifice, but not necessarily filling my oil and my lamp with intimacy. And I find that if I live a life of sacrifice without obedience, that it's unto the opinion of man and not to the connection with my father. And so I feel like Jesus showed up to me and he said <laughs> a year and a half ago, you're, you're one of the five, five foolish virgins that you're you have a lamp, but it's burning out and that you don't have a reservoir. There's so much outflow that you haven't in this season stewarded that place of um, your first love. And if you don't make a change, you're going to, like, I was already burned out, so I don't know what's next. You die. <laughs> like, um, so... The invitation for me that Jesus said was like, I want you to do what it takes to come back to, I, I had, had um, a love for Jesus since a young age. My parents raised me in an environment where there was love and joy in life. Not perfect, albeit, but I tasted it. And then I encountered him at 16 when he baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And he's, and then, you know, you do, you go through life. And I never fell away from Jesus. But in, by the time that I came to this point, it was just um, that my, my oil, I was like the foolish virgin. It wasn't the h highest priority. It wasn't the first place. So I hadn't been militant in protecting that place with Jesus, if that makes sense. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> So Jesus, I really, I said to Josh, Josh, I have to do whatever it takes. Like, I feel that there's this, I, I have to be almost like militant in doing whatever it takes to provide the space, the time, the, um, the lifestyle that will stir my affections to Jesus to a place where he, like, I, I had to fast my voice, fast my reputation, fast my people understanding me. It's just like kind of a season of hiddenness. Do you know what I mean? It's like a season of hiddenness with him in order for him to come back to that place of like, um, I can hear him speaking identity over me again, because if I don't live from a place of identity with Jesus, the connection is lost. There's nothing. I don't know who I, if I don't know who I am, then I, how, how do I know how to relate to him? You know what I mean? And so I just, I, for me, it, it looks like, um, and here's the deal. This isn't, I, I think sometimes for me, I get scared that people will view me as being legalistic. But for me, Jesus said, this isn't an issue of legalism, Amy. This is an issue of lordship. And so I want you to cultivate, go back to the things that you did at first. And the things I did at first were the spiritual disciplines. 
It was the things I did at first that were worship, prayer, communion, time in the word. And I love the word of God. I love the word of God. I love it all. I love the Old Testament. I love, the, I love Leviticus. I love it all. And it was just like, come back to that place of don't read so that you can impart to somebody else. Don't read so you can answer your friend that had a problem. Read to love me more, Amy. And Jesus just brought me back to that place where it's like, I don't want you to impart anything to anybody right now. And it's not because you're being selfish. It's because you can't give what you don't have. And so I, he brought me back to that place of like, I want you to come to the secret place and cultivate the lifestyle. And I want you to do it for the generations because every yes that you say to me, Amy, will reverberate through the generations. And you're raising regal women who are going to rule and reign and bring the kingdom on this earth. And so you have, you don't have a choice. So, and my father's, yes, my father was a first generation Christian. And his yes to Jesus reverberates to the generations. And every yes that we make to say, every yes involves a no. I can say, and here's the deal. They can be little things. And for me, it's different than you. But for me, my spirit is so sensitive that any little, like, I can't watch TV. I can't listen to stuff that maybe other people can listen to. I just can't because I find, I can't have that conversation with that person because I find that my spirit, and so for everyone, it's different. For me, saying for me that still small voice that says don't do it is going to be different than the still small voice that says don't do it but here's the deal the more we ignore the voice the dimmer it becomes so you, you following me so here's the here's the thing that the lord told me there's no condemnation here he is standing at the door knocking so all i had to do is turn all I had to do was turn, and he was right there. And he wasn't like, see, I told you that you would, you know, blah, blah. You know, it was just like, ah, I've been waiting for you, daughter. I've been waiting. And there is no condemnation. My blood has made you clean. Now let's get, to, let's get back to connection. Let's get back to first love. Let's get back to who I created you to be because you're not there right now. And that's okay. It's just that I love who you created to be, me to be. And other people need that person. So let's get back to that place. You know, and I think that the, the, the most amazing thing about cultivating a lifestyle of connection and intimacy with Jesus, I just love this. He showed me this a few years ago, but it's just something that I've latched on to is that in the natural realm, these really aren't very important anyway. In the natural realm, when we're hungry and we eat, our hunger subsides. In the spirit realm, when we're hungry and we eat, we become more hungry. Come on. So I found that I had lost that place of hunger, that true hunger for Jesus. And then what the most amazing thing is, is if I just take a, one baby step toward Jesus and I'm like going through my day and I'm like, wow, I'm not feeling it, but I'm going to choose to stop. I'm going to choose to crack open the word, not out of legalism because I'm desperate. <laughs> and I'm going to open the word and if I... I find that the more I eat of the word of God, the more hungry I become for the word of God. The more I get into his presence, the more hungry I am for his presence. I don't know if any of you have tried to cultivate a discipline that, that maybe you weren't good at at first. Like for me, when I started silence, I started cultivating the discipline of silence, like just listening to Jesus, just stopping and like listening. For at first, two minutes felt like a long time because my mind was, that you're wasting your time, you're wasting your time. And then it was like five minutes, and then it's ten minutes. And the more I eat of Jesus, the hungrier I become. The more I feast in his presence, the hungrier I become. And that's such an amazing spiritual principle. And some of us aren't even hungry anymore. And that's okay. All we have to do is start to begin to eat of him, and the hunger returns. Anybody hear me on that one? Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, we're going to, okay. Go ahead. That was, how many of you felt the, how many of you felt the Holy Spirit moving while Amy was talking? Could you feel that? There was an impartation, Amy. All of that um, set apartness. Okay. All of that set apartness, you've been saturating and soaking. And 
what happened when you just released that, it was like a wave of Holy Spirit just went out into the room. Just so you know. Yeah, and it was all, and I know that you weren't doing it in order for that to happen, but that just happened. Something just got released into this room. And I'm going to ask for you guys understood, did you feel the weight of what just happened? This, the substance of Jesus just flowing out of Amy? That's, that's what you would call the anointing. The, she has assimilated and cultivated that. So I want to ask you, Amy, out of the whatever right now is going on in you, to pray in a release and a sealing. By sealing, I mean in, embedding it. Yeah, S E A L. We don't want any C E I Ls. No, no, we don't want those kind of ceilings. I'm talking about embedding and connecting so it never leaves us. That kind of thing. Mm, yes. And I'm just, I'm just feeling so grateful for you right now, Amy, because I know that in and around that was a lot of warfare, a lot of confusion, a lot of warfare in and around that. Hell did not want you breaking through. But you did, by God's grace. So, boom. <laughs> yeah, God, I'm so, I'm so grateful, Father. I'm so grateful um, just for your divine interception that you love me enough to not let me continue down that path. Ooh. That you love me enough, enough to apprehend <laughs> me and um, Jesus, I know that each person in this room, you love them deeply exactly where they're at. You love them enough to say, I want a deeper connection with you, son. I want a deeper connection with you, daughter. And I know it, it might not look like it looked for me, but it will look like you showing up in a greater measure. And I just release a greater measure of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire over every person here a greater measure of the love of Jesus, that first love, that you would bring us back to that first love, that, that way we felt when we first touched and tasted of you and your goodness. And Jesus, I'm just releasing a white hot fiery love that we are, the, we are a church of the, the five wise virgins who cultivate our oil and we are ready yes. to receive the bridegroom. We are ready to come into the wedding feast with you, Jesus. And we just declare that. We prophesy that. And Jesus, that you're, you bring us into that place. And it's not because of anything we do except a yes in our hearts and a choice here and a no here and a yes there to you. In Jesus' name. Yeah, just uh, kind of breathe a minute. Just, just let that kind of soak in. <laughs> that was big. Josh wanted us to do communion today, but we didn't have enough. <laughs> we didn't have enough communion gizzies. It's in the mail. It's yeah, it's in the mail. So uh, we'll do we'll do communion next week. And uh, as we pray about what to do next week, but our agape meal. Um, do you mind if I share one more thing no, about cultivating, you know, burning for Jesus? Um, and then I know we're getting close to wrap up time, but I, I <laughs> it's kind of fun uh, this season for me personally, because um, the Lord is speaking to me um, through dreams a lot. I'm sure you've probably picked up on that every time I preach. Um, but I actually had a dream about this morning, um, and and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, well, he he was in the dream. He came up to the dream and said, um, "The people need to hear this." Um, and so I was like, "Okay," but I think um, cultivating the burn for Jesus, guarding your heart, Proverbs four twenty three. I'm I'm guarding my passion for Jesus. I think. I think, um, and I don't want to get too far into this, so I'm going to just share the general thing the Lord really um, has been working on me in. And it, it does come to this issue where the wisdom of the world replaces the power of the gospel. And I think in protecting burn for Jesus over, over the course of this last 16 months, I've been taking inventory where the wisdom of the world 
actually replaced the power of the good news of the gospel. And, and it's super subtle. It's super, um, you, you don't necessarily know that. And it's, it's a relational thing. The Lord has to show you these things because actually there's a lot of wisdom out there that is good and it's right. And it's, it's very good um, um, practices for people to walk in. Um, so, but I'll give, you, I'll give you two examples. One, the wisdom of the world says, save all your money. Two, the kingdom says, listen, give your fruits, fr- first fruits to Jesus. Right? And when you give your first fruits to Jesus, you're trusting him, and then he, you're, he's going to bring forth a harvest for you. So that, that would be an example. The wisdom of the world replaced the power of the gospel. Um, so but I think another thing, and I'm going to just be a little personal here, is um, over the course of time, whenever you're in a place of leadership or even in family uh, relationships, whether it's a close family, extended family, um, the world will tell you trust is conditional in relationships. And it's actually really good advice. It, it is, because tr- trust truly is conditional. But, and there is a but, that is not the power of the gospel. Because doesn't the word of God say, keep no record of wrong? Love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, love always perseveres, and love never fails. And, I, and so I, we were taking communion a while ago, and I felt like the Lord told me, like, Josh, what's going to create a burn inside of you is you let go of control, whether you can trust somebody or not, and just start believing the power of the gospel about them. It's time to press delete because I close my case on you. Will you close your case on them? Now, I am not promoting people being in abusive situations or really bad situations where you have to have boundaries. But what I am saying is protecting your burn. Because there is this place in life, I think, that people get relationally in family, whether it's kids towards parents, young people towards parents, or parents towards kids, or towards extended family, or if you're in a business atmosphere, you have relationships with people there, or in, um, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's all, re- there's all relational. But I think what happens a lot of times is people apply that good advice, but then they lose sight of the power of the gospel and the blood of Jesus, and that, that I'm supposed to look at them as if they never sinned against me because their place was closed at the cross. Thumbs up if I'm making sense right now. Okay. Yeah, so as Amy and I have been um, processing this in our own life, we recognize there's this reservoir of grace available. But as long as we're holding the case, as long as we're, um, uh, uh, well, we start stepping out of grace. The grace is there, but we're stepping out of it because we're, we're wanting to uh, monitor. We're wanting to just make sure it's still good enough rather than believing what the blood of Jesus says about the person. The blood always speaks the better word. What the blood of Jesus says about maybe one of our daughters, like, man, can I trust them with this? And it's like, uh, uh, wait. And, and then the Lord's like, no, wait. They'll pick up on that. Tell them you believe in them. Give them a chance. And they'll get it right. There's actually the story of um, Heidi Baker. She's an amazing prophet she's of God. She literally takes care of thousands of orphans. She had this one orphan, and uh, he was about 18 years old. And um, uh, she, they, he loved the Lord, um, but he kept wrecking their trucks. So he would help people drive supplies to people that needed food and water. And every time you'd give this young man the keys, he would wreck the truck. And this is Mozambique. I mean, they don't have a lot of trucks there. It's super poor, not a lot of money. And this guy kept wrecking the trucks. And her whole staff was like, you got to stop giving this guy the keys. He keeps wrecking the trucks. And the Lord said, give him the keys again. Give him the keys again. I think he went through like, she tells the story, like three to five trucks, like over the course of time. Love always protects, 
always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Well, this young man ended up actually becoming one of the most trustworthy people to deliver supplies to people that needed it. Here's my point. Unless she saw him by the Spirit, she wasn't going to be able to give him the opportunity to get where God was taking him. And so I think th- that in relation to protecting the fire has actually been really important to me because it's actually helping me pick up a lens of a hope-filled story and gospel. And it takes the worry off of me, puts the responsibility on Jesus, and, and uh, we see the power of God begin to move in ways that we never thought was possible. So that would be another thing in protecting the burn. Woo! Uh, a gospel lens, we're going to have you pray that and release that. A gospel lens, both this way, because we're, we have access to the grace of God this way, but a gospel lens toward people, because they're inseparable, right? I can't, you know, I can't say I love God and then not work this out relationally. And I think there, there's the test, right? There's where it's going to be the roughest, is we're going to have malfunctions, misunderstandings, really painful moment and the more we care about the family or the people the worse it hurts right and so to find the fire of god in the midst of our pain and hurt and disappointment and confusion that is a prayer see i feel like that is one of the seasons god has been taking us through here's why i think because he is wanting to build a wine skin that will hold the wine and not dissipate in two to three years. Because every single move I've been a part of, Josh and Amy, literally every one has had a major breakdown of relational breakdown. I'm talking about high-level leaders that were the instruments God used to unleash that move. And they had, they had a meltdown in their relationships, and it caused a, um, a wineskin fail. So what we've had to go through, what we're going through, what we've had, what we're learning is that nothing is more important than recovering connection through the gospel. But I can't do that just in my own humanity. If I don't call on Jesus, I am, I'm a fried. There's nobody that good. <laughs> There's nobody that capable of working through that enemy space and reconnecting outside Jesus. And so we're finding that God's setting us, I feel like he's setting us up as a family to having past tests and mature to the point where we can um, steward this level of the gospel and grace. And I couldn't be more proud of two people than you two. I literally, I don't know as if anybody, I feel more, I mean, godly pride, not weird pride, but godly gratitude for you two for the way you've been stewarding the season. And what you just said was like amazing. So we'll let's stand and I want to ask, this is a big one because so much of that fire, I, how would I say, you know, say it one more time, Josh, the fire of God is desperately and intimately connected to viewing people through the lens of grace. Would you say that one more time the way you said Because he... It was so like... I'm not sure how I said it. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing the Lord showed me that's connected to that is that when I get into enemy mode, then I have... Um, if Jesus is standing here with me in grace, then I step out of grace and I lose my connection to Jesus in order to keep my script playing in my head. Okay. Good Lord. We might have to do part two. I don't know. You guys get, are you like feeling the weight of this stuff? Okay, so just we're in a, we're in a holy moment right now in our family. So Josh, yeah, Lord. this will be our final prayer. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We burn for you. Revival is in our skin. Yeah. Lord, there's, there, we're hungry, we're hungry, we're hungry. Lord, we, we just declare we will be a people that burns for Jesus. Mm. We make that declaration in the ground right now. We, yep. we stand here and say we will burn for Jesus. 
And Lord, right now, I pray, Lord, for a great grace to come upon every person here, um, uh, young and old, husband and wife, singles, our teenagers, that there'd be a great grace to burn for Jesus. And I pray, Father, that that burn for you would cause all other things to grow strangely dim, mm -hmm. that there'd be such a burning for you that everything else, just it just it doesn't have its hold on us. It doesn't have its hold on our, our families. It doesn't have its hold on our households. Lord, we declare, we declare great grace in this house. I declare great grace over every person here this morning. And I pray that as they go throughout the week, that they would uh, experience, you will find and feel my presence. Lord, I pray for our, our marriages that feel your presence. I pray for uh, those in the trades that will find and feel your presence. I pray for our children at school that will find and feel your presence. I pray at home you will find and feel his presence. And Lord, we declare, we just thank you. You're taking our lukewarm hearts and you're tr transforming them into burning hearts. And whatever you're asking us to hand over, we give it to you in exchange for you. As long as we got you, we'll lay it down, Lord. We don't care what it is. Whatever you ask us to do, we, it doesn't matter. As long as we got you, that's enough. And so this morning, we say, kingdom of God come and will of God be done. Let's say that together. Kingdom of God come and will of God be done. Do it again. Kingdom of God come, will of God be done. And everybody said, amen.